Hey there, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the debut episode of On the Sidelines. I'm John Locke with Brad McKinnon and Dominic Damiano. Now, you may remember we used to have a sports show called Out of Bounds. We're changing things up, kind of giving this its own identity, but still same idea. Three people yelling at each other about sports, having some <laughs> fun along the way. Uh, we'll trash on the Red Sox, the Patriots coming up. But we do want to start with what's leading off, and that is the chase for the championship at the TD Garden. The Celtics and Bruins are about to start their playoff run. As of this recording, the Bruins have one game left in the regular season. That's against Ottawa. But the playoff picture starting to come into play a little bit. It looks like they'll play either Tampa Bay or Toronto in the first round. Meanwhile, the Celtics, that gets a little fuzzier. We'll talk about that coming up. But Brad, showing off the Bruins jersey here. Uh, who's going to go further in their championship chase, the Bruins or the Celtics? Yeah, I hate to say it, but I do want to say it's the Celtics. Because in the NHL, you have the one by four compared to the Celtics. In the NBA, you have one by eight in, the, in uh, the playoffs. So we're used to getting all these first round matchups versus very powerful teams that I'd rather see the Bruins play in the Eastern Conference Finals, say Tampa Bay or Toronto, like he just said, that's who we're lined up to play. If we went one through eight, we'd be looking at the Islanders or Toronto, and I'm more of a fan of both of those situations. I know Toronto is one of the ones we're talking about now, but I definitely do think the Celtics will make it farther because I mean, just look at the past few years with the Celtics. They've at least made it to the Eastern Conference Finals, I believe, every year for, what, five, six years now? Yeah, going back to the Brad Stevens era, I think they missed the at least the second round of the playoffs, I believe, two or three times since yeah. Stevens was a head coach going back to 2013. Uh, but you talk about the – we want to talk about the Bruins' sort of playoff uh, history here. I mean, this team has been – historical chokers when we talk about the last couple of playoff runs. Uh, last season, of course, the President's Trophy they won. They lost to Florida after being up 3-1. They lost a series in overtime of Game 7 despite Brad Marchand going on a breakaway at the end of the third. Uh, the season before that, they lost to Carolina in 7. Mm -hmm. To me, the Bruins, it seems like they're a victim of their own success because they're a great regular season team, but for whatever reason, mindset physical injuries they just can't get over that hump yeah, no that's definitely a big thing I mean last year the Bruins you had game one Pasternak messing up his shoulder you know and like you said even the year before the Hurricanes I believe with the Islanders who knocked us out in seven games it's always going down to the wire with the Bruins and the Celtics I feel like just do a cleaner in the playoffs you know and I, I do dislike me saying that but I'm just saying saying what I see you know I'd love to say the opposite but it's not how it's been. And like you said last year, we were up 3-1. We had the next man mentality because Bergeron was out. He comes in game five, yeah, he scores a goal, but we don't win a game after that. You know, So I kind of think the next man up mentality was good for the Bruins. I mean, look at us this year. David Krejci, yeah, he was always slumping when it came to points, but he was great passing. You know, He was a great second center, uh, second line center. And Zaka and Charlie Coyle both have surpassed what Bergeron and Krejci did last year. So the next man mentality definitely is a big thing with the Bruins, but hopefully we can keep that next man mentality going so we can at least see a couple rounds for the Bruins. I do believe the Celtics will at least make the Eastern Conference Finals, though. They're stacked. Brad Stevens is a genius. I mean, I loved Marcus Smart. I didn't think it was a good move at first, but that paid off. Trade a bag That's of potato much. chips if you ask LeBron James to uh, get Chris Tapp, Porzingis, uh, and Drew Holiday. Yes, sir. And Dom, I mean, whether it be a Bruins fan or a Celtics fan, it feels like both fan bases are really uptight when you talk about who's going to go further because the Celtics, they're afraid of playing the Heat and the Sixers. We'll get to that in a little bit. And the Bruins, we don't, went over that playoff history. I have a friend who, I don't know, joking or not, said he was going to take his DraftKings account and bet all his money on the Bruins to lose the first round series. And he's a diehard Bruins fan, so I don't know if he's serious or not. But I think that just speaks to how both fan bases feel about their team. They feel like they're built for success, but in the playoffs, they just crumble. Oh, absolutely. If you look at the history of the Bruins and the Celtics, I mean, hockey's more of a physical game. We both know that. But the one thing for the Celtics, if you look at their bench alone, how much that bench has matured and what they put out this year compared to last year, and then, like you mentioned, a couple lines, Brad, about the, the, those lines for the Bruins. Can't even compare the way the Celtics play basketball. If you mm -hmm. try to even try to compare to both sports. 
I think the Celtics are the team that's going to win. The, I think they're going to win the championship this year. If you look just, if you just don't even look at the f starting five, and you look at the bench, how much the bench, and just the numbers alone, the stats alone, I think this year's stats off the uh, from six going down the bench, as far as players go, it's it's like night and day compared to Cal last Pritchard, year. Richard, Hoser, all, all those guys. It's, it's crazy. Right? I mean, they, they won the game the other day. They didn't even have their stars out there, and they won it. Yep. And I was so happy when they signed Pritchard and Hoser and got those guys. I think they proved themselves time and time again, you know, and um, it just helps with the gelling of that, that team, you know, the, the talent you have on that team. And, again, look at the stats. You compare it to last year to this year. It's like night and day. And, unfortunately, for the Bruins, they uh, – Hockey's a physical game. I played hockey. You guys seen hockey. You know, you can see how the Bruins, two minutes left in the game, they're losing. All of a sudden, they all decide right. to play. Mm -hmm. And those last two minutes, are going to bounce them out of the playoffs. Yeah. You know, all so. Right. So I'll say this. For the Celtics, there's a lot more on the line, I feel like, than the Bruins. The Bruins, they're continuing to go through this roster rebuilding. They're trying to replace the impact of a Bergeron and Krejci. Mm -hmm. And it feels like there's such a drop-off between that second and third line for the forwards. Uh, but for the Celtics, you think about what ownership has put in financially for this Celtics team this year's roster. Don't forget the salary cap really changes. So if you're Wick Grosbeck or Steve Pagliuca, you know, you don't go far this year. You have to really rethink, like, what do you do with a Derek White who's up for um, a contract extension after, I believe, uh, next season? Jason Tatum, he's up for a Supermax. Does he want to come back if the Celtics continue to be a team that pulls the Buffalo Bills, gets to the championship, so then chokes? Does he want to go play out west? So there's a lot more on the line, I feel like, for the Boston Celtics. Um, but, you know, to get back to the question, who's going to go further in the playoff front, I think it's going to be the Celtics. I agree with you. Because when we talk about hockey, you can tell me I'm wrong by saying this, but I think it comes down to more puck luck. I mean, we've had eight it, seeds it making sometimes. the cup it final and winning sure. the cup. Oh, yeah. um, but for the Celtics, you, they play the eight seed out of the playoff, the play-in tournament. So Miami plays Philadelphia. The winner of that is the seven seed. The loser wow. falls to the play-in championship. They'll play either Chicago or Atlanta. So odds are you're facing either Miami or Philadelphia in the first round. And if it's Miami, as a Celtics fan, I'm feeling sick about it just because Joe Missoula, he can be outcoached right. as far as X's and O's goes. Right. And to me, if the Celtics um, face Miami, that's going to be a real uphill climb. Oh, for sure. For oh, sure. absolutely. They, have, they know yeah. how to play us. They do. The right. coaching does at least, you know. And it all comes to, you know, when you get in the playoffs, we all know it's, it's physical stamina. How much can you take? How much can you put up with? And right. I know I mentioned a little bit about hockey, how it's more of a physical game. you got to have the cavalry when they run up and down the court for over 82 games, I you mean, know. not everyone can be Jimmy Butler. On That's the right. You're staying out there for exactly. minutes, you know. So what you, what you think about, if, you think if the Celtics, you mentioned some good, uh, some of the ownership that makes the Celtics team win, uh, work, I guess. If they do not win, they're going to be noted. They're already being marked as the next Buffalo Bills of the NBA. Utah Jazz, even. Utah Jazz, good mm. point. I think, if anything, they're one more big guy away. The big guy they have now, he goes down, he's out for a couple of games. Thank God, again, we talked about the bench a little bit. Their bench is phenomenal this year compared to years past. They just have to, they might be just that one big guy away. So the Boston Bruins are looking for their first Stanley Cup since 2011. And for the Celtics... All I ask, for the love of everything green and sacred at the TD Garden, I'd like something a little more current than a 2008 championship banner. So any Celtics that might be watching Access TV at 4 in the morning, please win something a little more current than 2008. That's all I ask. Wow, that actually covers you. That's pretty good. Yeah, I got the 4X banner. <laughs> Coming up, we're going to play a little over-under here on, on the sidelines. We're going to focus on the New England Patriots and the Boston Red Sox. As far as win totals go, how low can the team on Jersey Street go? Adventure can be found anywhere, but the best place to start is in the forest. I spy something beginning with S. Snow? No. Snow-covered trees? Nothing to do with snow. Head outside to discover incredible animals <laughs> and beautiful plants that come together to create an unforgettable adventure. Wow. So grab your loved ones. Don't 
even. And explore a world of possibilities. Come on, this way. Visit discovertheforest.org to find the closest forest or park to you. Hmm, maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made her college years happen. Gotcha. Opening that education savings account when she was little. Spearheading a campus tour. And another, and another, and another, and another. Bam! Deciphering financial aid. She was like, what? Well, now she's like, yeah! you waste planning for college. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Back here on the program, John Lux, Brad McKinnon, Dominic Damiano, the debut episode of On the Sidelines, and we're going to play a little game, very simple, over, under, which way you going. Uh, so first up, the number of Patriots quarterbacks to take a snap in the 2024 season, the over, under is set at three and a half. I'm going to go under. I just think what they're going to do is uh, Mayo smart enough as once he gets his star rookie first round draft pick, and I'm hoping it's... J.J. Daniels, because I am an LSU fan, and I was going to go through his numbers a little bit and why he, they get him right now ranked at number two. He threw for 3,800 yards. He's a very mobile quarterback. It's what they need to run that offense, and if anything, he'll be, he'll be getting taught by a very good veteran, and I think that's what's going to happen. I think if he goes out, he's going to go out because of his own stupidity. Turns right, gets hit left, goes out. Next you know, he's gone. You know, something like that. But otherwise, I think uh, under two. If Only because if he does go out, your, your star does go out. Of course, your future star goes out. It's going to end up being some backup coming right. in to save the day. No, I'm the same way. I do ho I hope. It's yeah, we all hope. Half, you know? <laughs> I mean, I do. Daniels is the quarterback I want. If he's not there, I'm not going to lie. I would like to see us grab Marvin Harrison. But I would rather Daniels uh, when it comes to the quarterback pick. And uh, I know Caleb Williams, he's gone. He's going to Chicago. He's, I don't think that's someone that would have fit in in New England either, just how he's been in college and all that, and how he acts and all that. I know Bill Belichick's gone, but there's still kind of an image in New England. You know, right. It's not the do-your-job thing anymore, but it's don't be crying when you lose games and get ready for next week. You right. know, One of my favorite guys, my second favorite guy, they have him ranked fifth, Michael Penix Jr. from um, Washington, 48. 4,900 yards, just under, just over 4,900 yards. Uh, 6 2, 216. If I had a chance to he complete, said he, uh, make sure I get this right before I mumble on, I'm sorry. Completed 65% of his passes this year. If you watched him play for Washington, I had the privilege of watching him play four different times on national TV. And I liked his, his persona or the way he c conducted himself running that Washington offense. I thought it was really mature for a senior. I mean, the, again, some kids are going to make the pros, some are not going to make the pros. Mm -hmm. But to take advantage of what he had for talent on that team, I was really impressed. I, I was hoping, if anything, they don't get, again, my buddy Daniel's my buddy, right, from well, LSU. Buddies? <laughs> yeah, yeah, down buddy. Buddy. <laughs> right, is uh, Mr. Penix from Washington. I hope they get him. Yeah. And he's, he's in the same thing. He may not be as quick as Daniel's, but he does have speed and he can take off. You know, and he kind of reminds me of the quarterback, Josh Allen over in Buffalo, same same build. I've heard that from people. You know what I mean? He just reminds you of him, you know. Sure. And he's younger. You can build a team around him. You know what I mean? Whatever you think you're missing. Of course, we all know we need an offensive line. Right. So it sounds like you're going under. You're going under three yep. and a half yeah, as sir. well. I'll embrace the chaos. Give me the over. I'll hit that over <laughs> button, slam it. Um, you look at the past few seasons, how many quarterbacks have thrown at least one pass. I'm not talking the flea flicker, end around, jet sweep, things like that. Uh, 2023 with Mac Jones, Bailey Zappi. 22, they had three quarterbacks, uh, Jones, Zappi, and Hoyer. In 2020, Newton, Jarrett Stidham, and Brian Hoyer. You look at what the Patriots have right now as far as a QB depth chart. Um, Jacoby Brissett, who just signed with the Patriots. Uh, Bailey Zappi, who's probably going to be the backup or third string. Who knows? Um, then you have quarterback X, be it a free agent signing or in the draft. We'll get to that in a second. But... To me, I don't know if you can have your first-round quarterback take a snap in the first game of the season, the way the Patriots like to develop their rookie talents, because everyone thinks that you know, you're going to be the next Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud. Right. That's not going to be the case with a number of these quarterbacks, be it Drake May, uh, Caleb Williams, which we already talked about. He's not going to go to Foxborough. Uh, but still, you know, Penix, Knicks, the list goes on and on. Daniels, 
I don't know if you can throw him out there for week one. So Brissett would probably be your week one starter. Right. And depending on who you face, you could be getting the doors blown off in the first half. So Zappy comes in. You know, then you have that QB carousel. Then your rookie quarterback comes in. There's QB three. We get to week 16, 17. Oh, no, they're two and 14, two and 15. We'll go ahead and some and sign some guy from the UFL. There's quarterback four. There's your over <laughs> three and a half. You think so? Really? I, we'll I, I, I strongly I strongly. Him and I strongly disagree. If you look at the, the nonsense of the New England Patriots for the last 20 years, even with the Zappy thing when they put Zappy out there, the Patriots ain't smart enough to think of a fourth quarterback. They're going to put all their money into that first-round draft pick. And then after that, you're going to see tackles, guards, a backup, another center. Because you've got to protect need, the kid. We need that bad, Oh, too. my God. Yeah, you've got to protect that kid. Line. And, and I, again, that's, I, think you're, I, think you're, I think the over the three and a half, I think you're off. I don't think they're even thinking about being that smart. You're, way, you're giving them way too much credit. Right, I mean, if you think about no, again, I don't, I don't see it happening. I don't see it I happening don't. either. Some I mean, people, maybe Brissett might start to start the, yeah. the year for a game or two. And that's realistic. But I, I do see if we get a rookie, I do think Gerard Mayo will be throwing him out there. Oh, the absolutely! Really He'll have a bigger rib guy than everybody else uh -huh. out there. Some people call it negative. I call it being realistic. Next up, we have <laughs> QBs taken within the first ten picks of the NFL draft. I have a set at two and a half just to give you an idea of the draft order as of this taping. Things will shake up, obviously. Uh, Chicago, Washington, the Patriots, Arizona, the Chargers, the Giants, the Titans, the Falcons, the Bears again, and the New York Jets. Uh, over under two and a half for QBs taken within the first 10 picks. I'm taking over on that one. I am for sure because the Bears, they, they didn't trade away the first. That means they want Caleb Williams. That's how I take that. Washington, I believe, does need a quarterback, too, and we all know the Patriots need a quarterback. We just we gave up on Mac, and, I mean, I'm not saying we gave up on him. He had his chances, yeah. but uh, I definitely see three quarterbacks going within the first five picks, Absolutely. in my opinion. Absolutely. I really do, in the first yeah. five. I mean, you, know. you mentioned three of the, you mentioned three of the um, three of the teams right off the bat within the first five picks. Mm -hmm. then, if you go, then if you go down, who are the five, six? I'm sorry. Uh, we got... Bears first. Need a quarterback. Commanders. Need a quarterback. Patriots. Need a quarterback. Uh, Cardinals. De uh, maybe. Probably not. Murray signed Murray's, extension. Yeah. No one's going to take him. Sign, yeah. yep. uh, Chargers have Herbert. Giants have Daniel Jones. That's a that could fire. be. I maybe. mean, they gave up on Barkley, so yeah. why wouldn't they give up on Daniel Jones? Correct. You know. Yep. Exactly. That's that's one way to look at it in my eyes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go over as well, um, because like you said. You know, the first five or six teams, they need a quarterback. Washington may be that exception with Sam Howell. Uh, he yeah. looks like he's going to be a good quarter, quarterback, so maybe it comes down to giving him that protection. Maybe they go or Marvin Harrison Jr., yeah. um, not to mention the tight end and the wide receivers they already have. That could be interesting with Washington at two. How do they value that number two selection? Um, but the Patriots, I hope they take a quarterback. Um, I'll even take – a quarterback in day two if you get a Bo Nix or a Michael Penix low, yeah. but who knows where Penix is going. Um, you know, you work your way down. I mentioned Murray with the Cardinals. Uh, Chargers have Justin Herbert. So I'm going to take the over. I don't think it's going to be four or five quarterbacks, but still. It three. should yeah. be three. Yeah. It should well, definitely he, be three. You know, he mentioned Murray from Arizona. That poor guy's accident prone. Oh, yeah, yeah he, he opens the door out of the locker room. He chips a nail. He's, oh. on for, he's, out, for, he's out for a while. His you know? hand, the amount of time. Yeah, he's exactly. That. Right? Oh, yeah. So he could be, he, that could be borderline. That could definitely put us way over your initial over and under number. You know what I mean? If you think about all the times that poor guy's been out. I mean, he's no bigger than us. He's just, no, a, he's, he's, a, he's quick, he's athletic, he can run. He's very smart, you know, when it comes to the game. For the most part, but then again, it depends what he has for talent and how they're communicating in the field. And what happens? He gets hurt. He's out again. And if he can remember the playbook and not play video games overnight. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but number three here on Over Under, Red Sox win 75 and a half. As of this taping, they're currently at nine and eight. Uh, I'm not going to do the math on TV because I'll make an idiot out of myself despite <laughs> holding a big banner. I tried to do the math before I came <laughs> in. Did you? <laughs> yeah, subtract the three. Uh, so 75 and a half wins for 2024 for the Boston Red Sox. At first, when I saw your list, when you sent it over to me about the, you know, the, what was going on today's show, I, wasn't, I was not expecting them to beat, win the series with the Angels. I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that at all with the right. pitching because they've been so inconsistent. Uh, 
I had a chance. I did. Th I had a chance. They had a chance, which they did. They beat Oakland. Uh, now they're down to reality. They played a very good Baltimore team. Reality set in. Um, then they had uh, the Guardians. They might be able to win one game out of that. So now to get to your point, which I can't do, you know that, is I believe they will win over 75 games. Now I think of it as of right now. If you think of all the games they played over 162, I think they have a good chance of winning over 75 yeah. games. No, I'm, I feel you there. I am definitely, at most, I think we win 80 games yep. for the Red Sox. At most, that's where I think I am. I will take the over, but it's I'm in the 75 to 80 range for the Red Sox. I think the other thing that's going to really make that number unique, makes that number unique, if you think about Kansas City's playing very good baseball. Last year, we got swept by the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh -huh. right? So uh -huh. it's going to be, that's going to kind of tell exactly how this is going to play out as far as that 75 and a half number goes because you're going to get into league play are they going to be i think uh they're going to beat st louis uh i think they might actually have cincinnati you know yeah, what i mean play, stuff like that everyone so exactly about schedule now right so if you think about that are they going to man uh, kansas back in the day i used to be i thought texas was one of the most underrated teams in baseball when they were slowly building their team and putting it all together now they're world champions but if you think of like Kansas, who expect Kansas City Royals were going to have a winning record mm -hmm. this time of the season? I mean, Chicago is Chicago. They're the White Sox. The Cubs, like you said, they play everybody and out of 162 games. So, again, 80 games, but those certain teams in the back of my mind, I want to see how they play against the White Sox, mm -hmm. the Royals, the Cubs, the you know, St. Louis, the Pirates again. They swept us. They embarrassed us mm -hmm. last year. So it's, um, that's, that's pretty interesting. But I... I Whatever reason, right now I'm going to say it's going to go over. If we can stay healthy, I'm definitely there. Because yeah. as we all know, we already took a big hit for the Red Sox yep. organization that, to start the season off. You know, so yep. let's if we can stay healthy, I do. I think 80s where we'll sit. Right. We'll talk much more about the Red Sox coming up on on the sidelines overtime, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But I'm going to take the over because as far as seasons under 75 wins goes, uh, it went back to 1965, not counting strikes or the pandemic. They've only had three seasons under 75 wins, so you have to really suck to yeah, not under exactly. 75 wins. Exactly. And finally, we're going to just steer into the skid here as far as talk on Tom Brady goes. I'm sure you've heard about it. He was on the Deep Cut with Vic Blends podcast. I didn't know that was a thing, but he was asked if a team called, would he play for them? Tom Brady said, I'm not opposed to making a comeback. I don't know if they're going to let me in if I become an owner of an NFL team. I'm always going to be in good shape. I'll always be able to throw the ball. So to come in for a little bit, like Jordan coming back, I don't know if they would let me, but I wouldn't be opposed to it. There's actually odds on whether he'd come back or not. I think it's at plus 1,000 that he's going to unretire and what team he'd play for. The Raiders plus 125. That's actually the team that he's a small owner in. Patriots plus 300. Buccaneers plus 500. If you want to get good money, uh, you want to say Brady goes to the Dolphins, that's plus 1,200. So there's your betting minute. Uh, but over under snaps in 2024 for TB12, one half. I'm going to say zero. Yeah, I'm definitely going to say he, zero. He, he talks about this all the time. I love Tom Brady. Don't get me wrong. He, I mean, my childhood was great because of him. I had all the parades when I was young, and then I had parades when I was a teenager and could have fun at them. Not you me. Know? <laughs> yeah. But he was great. I mean, he, he does love the publicity, though. He loves the, the jokes and all right. this, you know. I follow him on all the social media. He's always joking about something silly every day, you know. And if he can make a few people wonder what's going on, he's going to make them wonder. But I, I do not see him coming back, especially with him ha being a part-time owner of the Raiders. I think the Randolph Oilers need a quarterback, so maybe he'll <laughs> yeah. make his comeback there, yeah. start off real small. And uh, work his works way up. way up the total Yeah, why not, again. you know? Oh, yeah. beat up by it's not a like bunch he got seven kids. rings or anything before, <laughs> yeah. you know? He'd be that guy like the Peyton Manning commercial in, in uh, SNL where you just start picking off the kids in the football field. Yeah. You know, just go deep. Right. I, I'm going to take the under as me well. Me too. Right. Absolutely. I'm totally with you guys. I, I can't see him doing that. Because I think what happens is you don't know what's going to happen with the Patriots. They want to sell them. He wants to sell them. He wants to sell them. Bob Trapp wants to sell his team. What's it? Some crazy number, a billion dollars or some. Yeah, yeah, uh, that in, right. uh I mean, Brady has the friends. He has. He can probably find the backing to buy the, his old team huh? and become the principal owner. That would it's be possible. Cool. We'd all love it here. Oh, yeah. 
you know? Like you said, the Raiders, right? Yeah. He's part of He's the... My, yeah. Right? So he'd probably give up that share and get his money back. Or I have no idea how it works. I'll be totally honest with you, because we don't know what goes on behind closed doors, mm -hmm. right, when it comes to something like that. So if he does do that, it would be, again, be nice to see him come home, be the principal owner of the New England Patriots, right? Get all these investors behind him, and you God knows you could probably do it like that. He's Tom Brady. Yeah. He's the greatest quarterback I mean, that will get a, a other sports... Derek Jeter, he'll get guys like that oh, involved. Yeah. You know, LeBron yep. James has something to do with the Red right. Sox group. Why wouldn't he want something to do with a football team, too? Absolutely. Can Absolutely. imagine Tom Brady's contact list on his phone? Uh, but just for a side topic, you want to be the Jordan comeback to the Wizards? Don't do that. that <laughs> yeah. well. Uh, right. We'll take a quick break here. We'll have the buzzer coming up, and we'll talk about a local dynasty here in Bridgewater. Don't go anywhere. Oh, you, you got it. You know, since I got rid of my car, I really enjoy walking. Okay. Got it. No. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Oh, you're home early. You live with your mom? That'll set your game back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Back here on the program, time to go to the buzzer as we end the show. Uh, we're going to keep things local here in Bridgewater as there's a dynasty at Bridgewater State. Uh, the school's cheer team went to Daytona and came back with a national championship. And not to quote LeBron James because he's my least favorite player as a Celtics fan, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't one championship or two championships or three or six. How about eight national championships going back to 2011? The squad won the 2024 NCA Intermediate Small Co-Ed Division III National Title, a mouthful there. Uh, one of the assistant coaches and former BSU cheerleader, Lindsey Betancourt, talked with Al Lacerda of BTV before the team went to Daytona and said the program is more than championships. Not only with just in athletics, but in life. Like, the program sets you up for success. So my favorite part of it is seeing athletes later and their success in their jobs and their families and their, you know, just careers, raising families. I have a couple of them have kids, so it's really good to see. But overall, it's just really nice to see everybody come together as more of a family than uh, like an athletic program. And they actually gave us uh, some swag here. Nice. As the kids say, swag, I think. Swag. Riz, whatever uh, the but words are. How about that? Eight-time national wow, champions. Wow, that is really cool. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, th there's definitely something in the water because they've been winning those for a while. I believe before that they had a, a run, too. And, I mean, when I went to high school, my grade, for some reason, our football team and the cheerleaders, they, they well, the football team never fully won, but our cheerleaders, they, they won every year couple Too of national well, championships. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I swear to God, there's something in the water out here. That's awesome. So congratulations to the BSU cheerleading team. And this will do it for some of you, depending on when and where you're watching us for On the Sidelines. You can watch the full show because we have On the Sidelines overtime coming up on YouTube, also on BTV. So for some of you, we'll say so long. For others, don't go anywhere because On the Sidelines overtime comes up right after the break. Dash SOS. Welcome to On the Sidelines Overtime, an extended version of our show. John Luck, Dominic Damiano, and Brad McKinnon. As we continue on in this, our debut episode, we're going to talk about some stuff that's happened in 2024, but with it being our first show all together here in the studio, we're going to kind of look back. Kind of weird to do a best of in April, but uh, anyways, a lot of big stories, including the Patriots firing Bill Belichick and just a couple of days later, naming Gerard Mayo as the head coach. Um, a lot of people wanted Bill Belichick gone. It was something that I feel like had to be done, but when it was done, it was one of those moments of, whoa, oh my God, that mm -hmm. actually happened. Right. Okay. If you think about it, right, if this is any other organization in the NFL, he's gone way back. Oh, he ain't hanging around this oh, long. There's no way. And, but because he had such a good rapport, he did win six world championships. Right. So he, he had that in his backpack. He could pull out six world titles, right? And he also... Made Tom Brady exactly what he is today. I mean, other players, Gronk, you know, just name another one. I mean, there's so many players we could go down that he actually helped out his career. And I think that was a little 
a little extra cushion for him to say, you know, let's give him another chance. And why we're like uh, burning at the stake as fans, wondering what the heck's going to happen next. And we're like, you know, you know, it happened. He lost Tom Brady. I mean, we all thought, oh, the th- was it week three? They almost beat Tampa Bay at home. It came down to the field goal. Missing oh, a oh, field this, goal. Right. In the downpouring rain. Yeah. It's yeah. downpouring right. rain when we go for the field goal. But when right. Tom and his boys went for the field goal, it was fine. You know? So, you, you know, you know, the crafts probably put all that together and thought, well, you know, let's give Belichick another chance. But you know what? It only can last so long. He, if you th- It only can last so he long. He had his chances, and especially... Since Brady left, you picked up Cam Newton. Yep. You didn't make the playoffs. You got close, but you didn't make the playoffs. He was supposed playoffs. to be a savior, right? Cam Newton was supposed to be the next mm-hmm. Tom Brady because yep. he had all this experience. Well, what happened right. there? Throwing at everyone's ankles. <laughs> you <laughs> know? Right, right? He almost looked like he was hurt. Him and I used to talk about that in the, uh, before in the past. Mm-hmm. How you'd look at him like, is he injured? He never stepped into a throw. Right. No, he Always kind of threw off his thing. back foot. He had his balance wasn't right as a quarterback, but he was supposed to be the next Tom Brady. And I think... To get to John's original question about Bill Belichick, he's a very he's, again any any if he's the Lions, he's gone. If he's a, any other NFL team, oh, he's gone. See you later, right. bye. And that's but why he hasn't been picked up either, too, because right. exactly. he wants all the control. That that's was one right. thing with him, and that's that's the biggest reason why I'm glad we got rid of him. Because everyone can say, "Oh, Tom made him," or "Bill made Tom." Right. They made each other. Now, supposedly you know? Atlanta. He didn't want the control. Suppose yeah. if I, I believe I heard that he just wanted to coach. Was he now Washington? Uh, the, up and over Washington. He was just there because his son, I believe. Yeah, his, his son's son there. Yeah. Over there. So he I got, think he just went to the combine or the draft days. Sure. He put on the hoodie form. and the hat yeah. and walked around like he was Bill Belichick. Uh-huh. Cut yeah. the sleeves and everything. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so Bill Belichick has a future as motivational speaker, um, but since the 2019 season. It's not like this is a quarterback that's flirted with, or a coach that's flirted with a 500 record. Right. Since he left from Tom Brady, 29 and 38. Unbelievable. Don't forget that conversation that Patriots fans had for years. Is this dynasty because of Brady? Is it Belichick? Well, you know what? Count to three. You know, it's a 10 round knockout. It was all Tom Brady. Uh, with a little bit of Bill Belichick kind of steering the ship, no pun intended. The credit I will give Bill for all the years that he was the Patriots coach, is our defense. Right. Like I said before, people want to talk who made who when it came to Bill and Brady. I really do want to say Bill Belichick made every single defensive coordinator that he had. I mean, look at Josh McDaniels, not Josh McDaniels, Patricia. He went over to the Eagles. He didn't help them. They were so glad when he left. You know, I mean, he did. Tom... He made all the offensive coordinators, too. I will say that. Look at Josh McDaniels. He left us way back in the day, went to Denver. I don't think he even hit 500 that year. Right. Then he went to the Raiders. You have a decent team over there. You had a decent team, I right. should say. Not to protect or be devil's advocate with the greatest coach that we ever had in yeah. NFL history. If you have, if he doesn't have, if Tom Brady does not have Bill Belichick as the next high school football coach, he's not molding him into great. You know, he put him in the right direction, and then Tom Brady just went, oh, yeah. right? He knew what he had to do to be – and all the other great players around him. So as much as, we, you know, we all know we need to go because of uh, no talent, and, again, that's him too. He wanted to be the general manager. He wanted to bring in the talent, and he thought he could mold these great players that he had on his list, and it didn't work out. and all backfired in his face, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. But, again – the greatest, co- one of the greatest coaches. He ever is for sure. In the NFL. I wish he was a better drafter, though. I'll exactly. Tell you that. He never right. drafted for Brady. He never got him weapons. I mean, he there were a few times he would pick up a few right. wide receivers. Usually, never in the first round. I mean, the last one, first round wide receiver we got was Nikhil Harry. Right. You know, but I do. I am glad he's gone. I don't like to admit that, but I am glad he's gone. I wanted Vrabel, but we all know. It was lined up already for Gerard Mayo. It was in paperwork right. that whenever Bill was gone, Gerard Mayo was going to be the next coach. Absolutely. If you paid attention, we all knew that was coming. And I, I do like him. I remember when I was young in the old, what was it, this, maybe it was Sports Center magazines. There were some magazines that used to always come in weekly, and Gerard Mayo was on one of them. I ripped the poster out of it, put it right on my wall. Right. And then look, at he was a great linebacker. You know? He was. He was I a do linebacker. hope that he can continue our defensive success because if that defense is healthy, that is in the top ten for sure, if not top five. You know, the stay defense. devil's advocate on poor Bell Belichick is, you know, gone, greatest coach, all that. If these, if these draft picks do work out, he's a hero. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. But he gave him the chance, and then it didn't happen. Plain and simple. So the one thing that I that worries me a little bit about Gerard Mayo is that classic phrase, it's better to deal with a devil that you know than the devil that you don't. I mean, for all we know, Gerard Mayo could be worse than Bill Belichick has been the past couple seasons as far as play calling goes. The X's and O's, you know, player personnel, cutting players and all that. For all we know, we could be talking about the next 2-15 and 15 season, or it could be possible Gerard Mayo ends up being the greatest thing since Bill Belichick, mm-hmm. and we're talking about 15-2 and two, uh, season, and maybe a Super Bowl championship, who knows, but it all starts with hiring your coaches, and one red flag to me is that when they went out and interviewed offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators, GMs, no one wanted to come to Foxborough. They had to go all the way down to the 12th spot on the list. Like, that's, you know, that's when you're desperate for a prom date right. there. Yeah. You know, spot number 12. They got Alex Van Pelt from Cleveland. Browns, yep. And a lot of people are wondering, why do we have Alex Van Pelt? You know, did something happen in Cleveland? Because you don't go from a playoff team or a playoff caliber team to the New England Patriots. Right. Um, as far as I'm concerned... We're going to get a good idea with Gerard Mayo with the coaches he has around him. And they got Dante Hightower. They have a couple other former players. The thing that concerns me is you start bringing back the class of 2008-2009 defense. You know, then we start talking about what Bill Belichick used to be, hiring all his friends and, you know, hiring all his favorite people. You know, then we have another golf club 2.0. There's a lot behind closed doors that we do not know about. Uh What 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 feathers did, did Mayo ruffle in the coaches when all the coaches got together at that meeting? We have no idea, but for whatever reason, like you said, those twelve guys, the first eleven, I ain't working with that guy. Yeah. Are you kidding me? You don't know what he's doing. First, you know, first by impression, yeah. guy knows how to play the game. He has a good idea how the team is run at the pro level, right? And I'm hoping we all, all of us are hoping. Everybody watching back home watching at home, it's in New England, is hoping that he shoves it right in their face in these kids' job because he's, supposedly he's a player's coach, right? He, right. He's, they right. have to no, play I've for him, he, right? And the, the, uh, he has this thing about relating to the players, communicating to the players as far as technique and why it you know, wasn't working, may, may, you know, showing them the film, seeing what you have to do right. So, again, all of us are hoping that he does come through. Right. He can't do it bad. Belichick did the last couple of years. Yeah. So I think everything's looking up. I, I'm going to give the guy the benefit of the doubt. Oh, it, it is looking up for you sure. Know? I did like the Dante Hightower signing because no matter what, he, in my eyes, that guy was a Super Bowl 49 and 51 MVP. Yeah. You tackle Marshawn Lynch at the one-yard line on one knee, and then your first strip sack fumble is on Matt Ryan yeah. to tie the game up. You know, I, I, I appreciate that man a lot, and I'm glad he is going to have something to do with the Patriots. For it's the all going to come down to talent. We all know, you know that. It all is, it's all going to come to talent. Yeah. How he relates to these kids, how the kids bind to a system, how they execute their system, right? Real, and uh, from what I understand, even when they lost, you heard, always heard the coaches and, and uh, the assistant coaches saying that nothing's different. We're, they're still acting like pros, but they're just not at that peak compared right. to the other team yeah. when it comes to talent that's not just thing. talent but like um doing your job get executing these plays right. and that's part of being our coach that's one thing i really hope our coaching staff can do with some of our defender players like christian gonzalez look at him last year the few games he had his first interception of the leap over tyreek hill how many other cornerbacks can do that in right. the league? you know right it, i mean i'm worried on the offensive side i am even with say we had a quarterback that's going to bring us to just the playoffs as a bottom spot. I'd still be worried with the new coaches. But on the defense, I do feel we're a little safer there because, I mean, he was a linebacker coach before. He played linebacker. He was a captain. I'm not as worried defensively, but I'm definitely worried offensively. I'm worried about the line offensively. Oh, the line's the biggest problem. Uh, I know we don't have that many weapons wide receiver-wise and all that. But the line is 100% the biggest problem for the Patriots' offense. If you it can is. protect that first-round draft pick oh, yeah. and he can have enough cons- confidence to execute the plays. If you think of it like this, defense has no idea where you're throwing the ball, if you're in the ball, whatever. They're just going off the snap of the ball, right? And if you if he, this kid can get it down and start gelling with his other receivers, like you said, 
Do we have a lot of talent? Not really. Mm -hmm. What do you have? One it's good running back. You had Stevens, right. right? You got Ramondre Stevenson, Kendrick Bourne, Hunter Henry, Zeke Juju Hodge. Smith Schuster. I guess right. If so you want to start talking about reliable offensive weapons, yeah. but that's about it. These guys probably could, could work at Walmart with those names. No mm -hmm. one knows who they are. They could walk in. No one knows who they are. Mm -hmm. Like J.D. Martinez, he played for the Red Sox to go off the beaten path a little bit. He'd walk around. He'd walk around the North Shore Mall. And they do a phone interview with EEI, and it's like, how's it going? Well, aren't these guys, going? no one knows who I am. No one has any idea. And that's the same thing with these Patriots. Right. No one really knows. And if you don't get an offensive line, you'll know because they'll be on that, they'll be on the Boston oh. Globe, any reserve list. Is, mm -hmm. no, he's out for the season. He's out for the season. You got to get a line. You got to drop the quarterback, get a line. So just to get back to Van Pelt, and yep. I'm just going to continue beating on this topic here because Van Pelt, he didn't call any plays on offense during his time in Cleveland. The only time he called plays was the two games that Kevin Stefanski was out due to COVID. So mm -hmm. that's a red flag for me. Yeah. And this is an offense that was a rudderless ship that just kind of floated in the ocean. Um, Lucky 29th and total passing yards. You know, Tied yep. with Carolina for points per game. That's what, you're, that's what you're competing with right now. Yeah. We aren't in the old days where we're competing with Peyton Manning and Phillip Rivers. Now it's competing with the Jets and the Panthers, which, I mean, Gerard Mayo has uh, quite the task ahead of him as uh, the new Patriots head coach. Right. Um, so we talked about the Red Sox earlier in the show. You talk about J.D. Martinez not being recognized. Right. Uh, you can say that about the 2024 Red Sox. Exactly. Can't recognize any players. Right. Um, they started up the West Coast road trip. I think it was 7-3, and three, uh, but they came home. And they look like the first part of Angels in the outfield. He had Devers colliding with Tyler O'Neill, uh, yeah. causing him to get eight stitches. But what do you make of the Red Sox dumpster fire? Because to me, this starts with ownership, goes all the way down. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree with that. Like he's just like we just talked about doing the JD Martinez scenario again. These guys could walk through the mall. None of them. I wouldn't know. We know who they are. I wouldn't right? know a single Red Sox. You might take a glimpse. I'm like, didn't I see you on a, a my ESPN app come up something about something about you getting hurt? Right. Yeah, that's it. If you know what I mean. But otherwise, I you know these who do you have for town? The eight guys last year they used to be the worst team in base running. Now you got you you one of your best contact hitter has eight stitches in his head because nobody can call. That's call something you learn in high school uh, baseball. Uh, you learn that early. Literally, early that. call yeah. the ball, right? Go. Oh yeah. And I understand the fans. The fans are into the game and stuff, and you probably can't hear them. But there's always body English you use to let them know you have you know who's going after the ball or whatever. But that's, like you said, angels in the outfield. I bet the Angels were swarming around Boro when he got his stitches in his head. Yeah. You know? Oh, my God. I mean, just to think about that. No, I mean, again, I'm hoping for them to win over 70, 75 and a half, win almost 80 games. And, again, it's going to come down to how it all plays out. But right now, it is it is the ownership. Uh, Who are you oh, putting out on this team? John Henry. 100%. Right? Not just all him, but there's a lot on John Henry in right? my eyes. I mean, I went to... I'll be honest with you, I, I like baseball, but my first ever time at Fenway Park was to watch a hockey game. I went for the Winter Classic last year. Oh, that's cool. They were chanting, fire uh, John Henry at the hockey, <laughs> hockey game, game? At That's awesome. Louder than they were cheering, go Bruins or go Pens, you know? Right. It was cool when I went to the Winter Classic. You had all your Penguin fans in the worst spot of the stadium, obviously. <laughs> that's where they sold them. And I was over near the Monster in center field, you can hear the Let's Go Bruins chant, then over there you just heard the Let's Go Pens chant right after. It was That's a really, really cool environment, cool. for That's sure. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I had a great time. I think what's also going to happen when we think about the Red Sox, as we're talking a little bit about the Sox, these, this fan base is only going to put up with so much. I mean, they didn't sell out opening day, right? Mm -hmm. They usually sell out opening day. Oh, yeah. Eventually what's going to happen is these fans are going to slowly, oh, you want my tickets? There's my tickets. Yeah. And you give yeah, them, just give take them. them. Yeah, you just send the tickets. Look at them. Oh, I got something. I got a Christian to go to. I can't go to that game. Uh, Where you try to get out of the, you try to get out of that event. So you go to the Red Sox game. It's all going to backfire. Then the sponsor is going to say, "Well, you're not going to put good, good, pro good product on the field. Why am I giving you almost a half a million dollars uh, to put up my sign at Fenway Park and pay for these commercials when no one's even seeing it? Yeah, and we're in last place. Mm -hmm. And you're not, you're not putting butts in the seats anymore. So you say that there's going to pack the park with tickets that are regifted and all that. To me, that says more about ownership. Exactly. John Henry and Tom Warner 
are the biggest jackass ownership group <laughs> that is in Boston sports right now. You look at what happened just from a PR standpoint with a Larry Lucchino funeral. Everybody went to the Larry Lucchino funeral from the Red Sox. Sam Kennedy, um, Theo Epstein. Yeah. Where was Moneybags John and Cheapskate Warner? They were off doing something else. Henry was sick or something, but he hasn't come out and said anything. Probably looking at his NASCAR. This ownership doesn't care about this baseball team. This baseball team for this combo group of jerks is nothing more than a slush fund. Yep, right. You need money for Liverpool, okay? Mm -hmm. You need money to buy the Pittsburgh the Root Penguins. Sports. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. the Penguins. Yeah. You want to buy a basketball team. Okay, we'll just dip into the Red Sox fund. To me, this ownership group isn't going to learn until nobody goes to the games. Exactly. Unfortunately, your fan base is a bunch of... People buying the stupid $9 college tickets so oh. that way they can go get their drink on until the sixth inning when the bar turns off. Yep. Then they go to the cask. Unless, oh, wait, you want to sing Sweet Caroline? Okay, wait we'll sing that. Yeah. Right. Buy some stupid Red Sox shirt and hat that goes, guess where, right into that vicious circle of the slush fund. That's what Red Sox ownership is. We're seeing the result of that on the field because they think they're the Tampa, the Tampa Bay Rays, but when in all actuality... They play like the Savannah Bananas and just yeah. throw the ball all over the place. That's awesome. right? Savannah Bananas could probably beat them two out of three right I, now. I wouldn't doubt it. I, mean, I brought my nephew to the game in the Rocks last year. I wouldn't doubt it. They'd be dancing all around them, literally. But I think <laughs> what you said and a couple things I mentioned, what we all mentioned, people are going to have enough of this this mockery of what right. you put on the field. And I feel bad for the players because these players are just trying to earn their paycheck you know, they're at that talent where they can compete at that level, the MLB level, and the, and they're going to lose their fan base because, like you said, where's that money go? Slush fund, uh, sure, all, all that stuff. Uh. He doesn't care about the average Joe who works hard for their money. They don't care about that. They just want to put butts in the seats, and this area, our area, is going to have enough of it, and they're going to stop going. And like I said, I'll be giving John Luck tickets. He'll be like, no, nope, I got a bar mitzvah for that day. I can't mm -hmm. go. Well, whatever, I got a birthday to go to. Like, you know what? I, I got to go edit a show. I don't have time for that. I mean, I looked the other day at uh, last minute tickets, $8. Yeah. $8 to get into Fenway Park. That's Imagine crazy. That. That's crazy. You think about where this team was six years ago, seven years ago, and now it's just gone down the drain. And it's sad to see yep. because you have a deaf ownership that is absent, doesn't come in to see what's going on, mm -hmm. didn't show up to winter weekend. That Red Sox fans paid for hotel rooms and events at the MGM Springfield. Uh, just completely and utterly ridiculous. Really? Right. The only yeah. thing they care about is going to Jet Blue Park in the summertime, people paying $3,000 to play with your old Red Sox rival and put on the uniform, and that's it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's just a silent, 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 silent voice with this ownership. Oh, no, they, they don't, in my opinion, they don't care. No, you're not wrong at all. You you're know? not. And again, they're gonna, it's going to be a matter of time before these big sponsors are going to start pulling their money and I'll hypothetically use Jordan Furniture. We better edit that out. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> they're going to pull their big sign and say, I'm not paying you a half a million, whatever it is, a quarter of a million dollars in all these commercials because you ain't putting... Jordan Furniture does more for the fans of the Red Sox, oh, no, getting do. gear and giving it to little leagues and what the Red Sox do. And I feel bad for the players because these kids are good players. They want to compete, and they're not going to have a fan base. I, I do like this table and chair set for the record, but uh, just want to get to Sorry. one more topic <laughs> before we get to uh, the end of the show, and that is the Women's National Championship in College Basketball getting 18.7 million viewers. Oh, wow. We know a big reason of that was because of Caitlin Clark, who yeah. has just taken the world by storm, the first pick, first pick from yes, the uh, Indiana Fever. Um, they had four million more viewers in that championship game I talked about than the second most watched game, which was just two days prior, Iowa and UConn. You look at the ticket prices for the Final Four for the women, double what the men's Final Four tickets wow. were in Arizona. Um, to me, I think this kind of raises a bigger question and maybe a much needed question as far as uh, has women's basketball maybe met men's basketball in terms of popularity? I don't think not yet. On, it's the, col now. on the college level, it's good to see that. You know, I, the WNBA, that's going to take them a while to get more viewers. But on the college level, I mean, yeah, she, she brought in a lot of people. A oh, lot she, of people are going to yeah, pay she attention. She definitely to her, woke up know. that whole, whole 
oh, yeah. women's basketball thing. I, I think of Larry Bird back in 79, and I know you guys, you know. And I remember when he played Magic Johnson, I was watching that game, and uh, of course gets drafted by the Celtics. I think she is going to be one of the key points in bringing WNBA basketball up. Oh, if she can compete with the speed of the game, like mm -hmm. you know what I mean? No, it's like the PWHL, the Hockey League. Uh, they just came out with one this year. And the Bruins, luckily, were able to trade for the girl that everyone loves. She's a pretty girl in hockey, but she'll still fight for you. Right. You know, she, I mean, the PWHL, I've watched a few games, they hit over there. It's pretty cool to see a female sport getting a little bit of attention, you know, but like not trying to get off track, but what I was just trying to say is yeah. Boston kind of has that kind of girl on our team now. She wasn't our, ours before. The one that's going to get people to pay attention. Right. You know, and that's exactly what, what's her name is? I'm already forgetting. Caitlin, Caitlin yeah. That's exactly what Caitlin's going to do for the NWA, is bring the viewers up. That's all right. I do that all the time. I forget my name sometimes. <laughs> yeah. he, is, he is at that age. But anyways, yeah. you talk about the draft. Last night was a huge night for WNBA because you have Caitlin Clark moving on, Angel Reese, Camilla Cardoso, um, Cameron Brink. Th these are cornerstone names. To me, I think it could be what the NBA had in 2003 with Kevin Durant and LeBron James. Uh, but I think it... I think that's a very telling sign, but the big question is who comes back for college basketball next year. Um, you, you have two big-name players right off the top of my head, Juju Watkins from USC, Paige Beckers from UConn, but I think this was a big year for uh, women's college basketball in terms of growth. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. With those numbers, for sure. If you're going to beat the men's college league, too, on views, uh, not, they didn't, but they got close. Yeah, you know, they were very close to beating it and NIL, which is a topic we'll talk about another time, but that's a big reason why women's college basketball was so big this year. Um, so we did over-under for a game. We have one more game before we go. Okay. A game that uh, is sweeping community access stations. I have a random sports show everywhere. Uh, it's called Would You Eat It? So we know uh, a lot of sports stadiums kind of have their own unique tastes and brands and all that. So I have some selections here from Major League Ballparks. These are actual food products. <laughs> First up, we have the Rainbow Cookie Egg Roll. Just from the name of it, would you eat it? I love sweets, I'd say yes. I, I love sweets yes, too. Yes. Rainbow cookies are my favorite cookies. I'm not a big egg roll guy, but if, gonna, if the texture is in there of the rainbow cookie, I'd eat it. If something good's in there, then yeah. Oh, absolutely. It. It's a multicolored, layered, Almond flavored cookie, a layer of raspberry jam, chocolate syrup rolled and fried in an egg roll wrapper. Uh, you sold me. You can get that just a five hour ride down to a city field in New York. Uh, nice. We go to Arizona now and the millionaire steak sandwich, there's no coins or dollars, but um, beef tenderloin medallions, black truffle cheese sauce, uh, cremini mushrooms, didn't know that was a thing, and uh, garlic aioli on a roll. So the millionaire steak sandwich in Arizona. Uh, you want you, some of that? You said steak. I'm a big meat guy. Right off the bat, I'd try it. I would. Take out the mushrooms, I mean. Yeah. I, just I heard like the truffle, too. Mushrooms. I like the truffle. I, I, sometimes I'll go out to a fancy restaurant and make sure that's on there, but I, I do that. I mean, I can't pronounce those mushrooms. If I can't pronounce it, I'm going to stay away. The black truffle. Exactly. Oh, the mushrooms. The, the cremini actually, mushrooms. Yeah. Um, and now to the reason that we had this segment, because I was scrolling on social media and found the warehouse dog at Oreo Park in Camden Yards, a foot-long hot dog with horseradish um, infused brick sauce. Don't know what that is. Uh, crispy onions, pit beef queso fundido on a pretzel bun. Again, if I can't pronounce it, it right. I don't know what it is. So. I might take a bite. I might take a bite. I don't know if I want that whole hot dog. Maybe get some tums with all with that it. stuff yeah, on Yeah, no there. kidding. I, I'm know? definitely, everything without the horseradish. Yeah, the horseradish. That was oh. the first thing you said, and I'm like, I don't know about this. It, so, it sounded like it was getting better, but right, it did. the horseradish is too strong. <laughs> kind of up it's too down. strong. Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, finally, we go to Houston, and you can get their pennant pickle dog. A Texas chili Angus hot dog, jalapeno slaw, fried pickle chips, dill aioli, and green onions, um, all set. I, 
At my age, don't eat heartburn. Yeah, I can't do that. That's reflux. exactly what that sounds like, is heartburn <laughs> and acid reflux. That's right a lot of meprazole for me. <laughs> oh my God. That would turn my stomach upside down. You know I got a little bit of a messed up gut, that thing in my I'm gonna pass on that one. I'm gonna have to say no to one. Was it the dill aioli or the fried pickle chips? Uh, it was both of those yeah, when I heard absolutely. both of those. All right, well, we made it through the first episode. Nice. We didn't get canceled. Right. Did anything <laughs> We're wrong. doing good. We're doing good. We thank you for watching the debut episode of On the Sideline. For Dominic Damiano, Brad McKinnon, I'm John Luck. Thanks for watching. Thanks.